So for this week's LaRouche Pack in Action show, we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm Alicia Saratani with LaRouche Pack TV, and joining me today in the studio is Benjamin Denniston from the LaRouche Pack Basement team. Uh, this week we're going to discuss the action of an idea. And the idea is the appropriate conception of economic value, which Mr. LaRouche and just a handful of other individuals uh, have recognized. Now, given the dramatic events of the past couple of weeks going on in our neighboring hemispheres, namely the uh, BRICS summit, where Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Argentina, and a host of other uh, Latin American countries got together and recognized we need to make a break from this global economic order, this, this collapsing transatlantic financial system. They obviously are asking a question, um, if this transatlantic system is collapsing, they must, it must be based on a false idea of economic value. The question is, what is economic value? What is the appropriate action of mankind on the planet, in the solar system, and beyond? And what do we base this new economic order on? Now, these, these developments continue to, um, to take, are continuing to take shape. Um, there are, there's blowback from it, there's reactions from Europe, from London, from Washington, and then there's an inspiration going on among other members, uh, other nations in Africa, in Southeast Asia, et cetera. Um, but this, as if people have been, uh, if people have watched the Friday webcast with Matthew Ogden and Dennis Small, this has now become sort of a backdrop to something Mr. LaRouche has been emphasizing. Um, which he has said must become the metric for the rest of the world. And that is the Chinese Lunar Program. Now you might say with all this dramatic, um, with all these dramatic developments occurring um, all around the world at a rapid pace, why is Mr. LaRouche putting so much emphasis on the Chinese Lunar Program? What is it about this program that Mr. LaRouche has said must be the standard for any sane economy? Yeah, I think it's a, exactly the right question to pose and put on the table because I thought it was very provocative that Mr. LaRouche said it the way he did. And uh, I can reflect back about a week ago we had some discussions with him and looking at this whole we just reference this dramatically changing world situation. And he put on the table in some early discussions, said, look, we got to start to think about what does the world need right now to survive? You got many nations in poverty. You got horrific conditions that have been imposed on nations around the world. You got a collapsing U.S. economy. What is the bill of materials needed? What, are the, what, are, what is the production needed to support a world population? And then he very quickly went into well, if you're defining that picture, we have to start from the most challenging aspects. And he immediately pointed to what China's doing with their lunar program, with their space program, as defining the most frontier aspect of the global shift right now and the most frontier aspect of a competent economic policy. And he said, this is now the metric, what China's doing with the moon and looking at the prospects for helium-3 from the moon becomes the measure of any sane national economy right now. And so probably start just to look at what is China's lunar program. Now they have um, uh, a five-stage lunar program. The first three stages have been completed, the first um, three missions. The first two were uh, um, orbiters, spacecraft they sent to the moon to orbit. The third one was the lander, which happened in December 2013. And that's the first thing that's landed on the moon, soft landed on the moon. We crashed something into it, which was interesting, but it's not the same as actually landing a spacecraft and deploying a rover to investigate things. They were the first nation to do that in a couple decades. I believe the 1980s was the last time. And I believe it was the Soviet Union, if I recall correctly. So this is something that hasn't happened in decades. China put this lander on the moon, um, brilliant success, and they deployed this rover to go around and scout out the moon. So that's the most recent um, third stage of their lunar program. And what many people have noted is that the 
uh, apparatus they used to land the lander and, and the rover is capable of landing something 10 times heavier than what they actually landed. So it's been noted by certain lunar experts in the United States, we should take note, the world should take note of the fact that they've demonstrated a much greater capability than they've initially deployed. And this is one indication of many that they're thinking about a serious development perspective. Now, the next lander is scheduled for 2015. And the latest I've seen in the news is that they're still looking at exactly what it's going to be, but it'll probably be something upgraded from what they just did with the Chang'e 3 mission. Uh, this will be Chang'e 4. And then the final stage of this lunar program is the Chang'e 5, which will be a lander, something that will actually sample the, the regolith, the lunar soil, dig deep into the lunar surface, grab subsurface material, send that back up to a rendezvous with a spacecraft in lunar orbit, and then send that sample back to Earth. A very complex, sophisticated um, mission, but that is the stated goal of their lunar program. Now, that's in the context of a uh, robust and uh, across the board very serious ex, uh, expansion of China's spacefaring capabilities. And again, it's all oriented around this idea of development, of uh, development of the moon, development of um, the Earth-Moon system. They're developing larger rocket systems. If you're going to do any of this, you need big rockets to get off the Earth. For us to go to the moon, we needed to build the Saturn V rocket huge rocket. We couldn't build it today if we want. We couldn't just roll one out today. It took a huge effort to get that. China's in the process of gearing up towards something similar. They're developing a uh, space station, a program to develop their own space station. Um, there's been discussions and investigations and studies about lunar bases. They haven't said anything officially in terms of a stated goal from the government, but they have people looking at this, and they just completed a um, program called Moon Palace One, where they had um, some people living in a completely self-contained apparatus on Earth, uh, providing their own food within the apparatus, providing their own uh, oxygen for 105 days to simulate what it would be like to have a palace, or I don't know if it's quite a palace, but have some type of lunar base that could sustain human life on the moon. So it's clear that you look at all these things, it's clear they're going for in the direction of serious lunar development perspective. And what Mr. LaRouche has identified as kind of the keystone, the pinnacle of this, is this emphasis on helium-3. And uh, just looking at some of the headlines um, that were coming out around 2013, December, when they uh, first made the successful landing, one of the first headlines that popped up in a search was, is China's Jade Rabbit, which is the name of their rover, the rover that they deployed from the lander, is China's Jade Rabbit a precursor to a helium-3 empire? And that kind of gives a flavor of what any sane and serious person is, is looking at right now. Um, this has been echoed by serious uh, uh, former astronauts in the United States, lunar experts in the United States, international ex experts saying it's clear that they're looking at helium-3, which is the most important fusion fuel for the coming century. And uh, they're looking at being able to get it from the moon as part of a um, moon-earth fusion space program. And uh, this has also been uh, stated clearly by uh, the so-called father of China's lunar program, a man by the name of Ouyang Ziwan, who has repeatedly pointed to the importance of helium-3 fusion as the fuel needed to support China and support a global fusion economy into the future. So just in case people don't know, this, this is a very special uh, isotope of helium. It's a type of helium which is basically absent from the Earth. You maybe have like 10 or 15 tons of this 
in the entire planet are the estimates. A very minuscule amount overall. Um, estimates for the moon are between 1 million and 5 million tons. So orders of magnitude more. Now it's been estimated that 100 tons could power the current global economy for 100 years. Or for one year, I'm sorry, for one year. 100 tons could power the entire global economy for one year. You know, 100 tons of coal is not going to power, you know, a nation for a year. But this helium-3 fusion fuel is so much more energy dense, it's a higher energy flux density, 100 tons of this stuff, which is not that much if you're talking about powering the entire planet, mm -hmm. could do it for an entire year. And there's between 1 to 5 million tons of this stuff up there. So this has been something that serious thinkers have been looking at for some years. And it's also been referred to as the Persian Gulf of the 21st century. Mining, the, mining helium-3 from the moon is the new uh, energy renaissance that will completely overturn the current um, hydrocarbon and coal and gas uh, economy, uh, modes of operation on the earth and provide a complete revolution. So this is um, extremely significant and I think what Mr. LaRouche said when he said this defines the um, standard for any sane economy and I think is exactly to the point. Yeah, well there are um, there are a few examples of sane economies right now on the planet. It's a nice way to put it. It's a, it's a polite way of putting it. <laughs> um, and I want to reiterate something that uh, Dennis Small said in the Friday webcast, which was from Mr. LaRouche directly, which I think our viewers should begin thinking about in a, in a, in a serious way, which is we will, we will be responsible for changing the way we think about value. Um, you may not like the system of values today, but that doesn't mean that people understand what economic value ought to be. Mm -hmm. And what Mr. LaRouche, what was communicated, as Mr. LaRouche said during the webcast, was that in giving, using China as an example, he said that uh, China, with its lunar program, which involves this mining of the helium-3, um, for the purposes of achieving a complete transformation of the relationship of man, not only to our biosphere here on Earth and the way we conduct our economic, economic activities here, but to totally transform our relationship to the solar system and beyond. So therein lies uh, one, an idea, the idea of value, which is man's ability to transform the, uh, the, his surroundings. And then later on in the webcast, um, Dennis Small mentioned something that uh, Russian academician Vladimir Vernatsky had said, which is that human thought modifies that which we call the laws of nature. Mm -hmm. So human beings are the, are, the, um, are the change agents, I guess you could say. They, they are the, what causes the change. And therefore, if you are going to build an economy around human beings, it can't be what exists today. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you have more from your work with Mr. LaRouche or more on the, uh, more on how the ch this Chinese lunar program sort of exemplifies that leap. Um, because what seems like a revolutionary step for people now is actually going to have to become the norm, the standard. Yeah, absolutely. And it goes right to the core of economics as a physical science. And Mr. LaRouche has spent his life developing. Um, which really comes to a question of what is human society? What is the human species? What is mankind? And Vernatsky certainly had a very clear insight into that, that mankind self-defines his relationship with the biosphere and soon to be the solar system by his cultural development, by his creative thought. He, he discusses uh, scientific thought as a geological force which is a very interesting and provocative statement to concept to reflect upon. Um, uh, the, uh, another way this can be looked at is from the standpoint of economics, for example, is if human thought and human scientific discovery is the substance, is the basis of human society, then what does that say about resources, for example? Mm -hmm. 
or value, for example. Um, it really is relative to your development of your economy. Um, uh, in uh, you know, 150 years ago, a coal-fired power plant was incredibly valuable because it represented an upshift, an increase in the energy flux density and capability of society relative to the previous state mm -hmm. because there were certain scientific discoveries, technological developments that allowed the creation of a new, more powerful power source for society. But that doesn't mean that, that same physical object has the same value today. Today what we need is fusion power. That represents the next leap in the productive capabilities of society. Right. So value is not uh, an object per se. Value is defined by the process of advance. Um, Mr. LaRouche, we were, we were talking with him the other day in the basement, and he said, he said basically reality is creating something that hasn't existed before. That's really all you have. As that, that's your basis for reality of human society. How do you create something fundamentally new, a more advanced, a higher state of society than has existed prior? So this is, you know, this is, you have to understand uh, what is human, human species, what is human society. And that, you have, a scientific insight into that is critical for defining the types of policies we need uh, today to handle the type of challenge that we're looking at globally, and Mr. LaRouche has pointed to. You know, another aspect he raised today, which I thought was very uh, uh, clear and important to, to echo, is he said, this means we need to end the cheap labor system. Cheap labor needs to be done. We need to end the idea that we're just going to use people as a muscle source to perform certain, you know, repetitive actions as a cheap labor force. You're just treating your population like an unskilled, um, form of cattle or something. It's the Henry Carey, uh, cheap goods make cheap men. Yes, yeah, yeah exactly. And what we need is, uh, what Mr. LaRouche has defined is increasing the productive powers of labor. How productive is each individual in society? How do you increase the ability for any one individual with his daily work, with his week's work, with a full 40-hour work week, how do you increase that person's ability to produce more of the goods needed by society. To get more work done. To get more work done, to, to produce more than you consume. Right. To produce more goods of a higher quality than you did in a previous cycle. How do you increase the productive capabilities of your labor force of society? And one of the most important uh, determining factors of that is this issue of energy flux density is what is the energy flux density of your economy? What qualities of power source are you wielding? And how does that reflect upon and uh, uh, come back to determine changes in your resource bases, your natural resources you have available to you? So if you just take a look at the history of development of human society, you see a very clear progression of moving to higher and higher sources of energy flux density going from a wood-based society to a coal-based society, going from chemical modes of energy, wood, coal, natural gas, to a completely new domain of nuclear for sources of energy, of fission, of fusion, of helium-3 fusion, a more advanced form of fusion. And with this process, you see an increase in the energy flux density of your economy the higher amount of energy available per capita, per person, and higher qualities of energy that will allow each individual worker to become more productive, to produce more with their, with their work, to create a larger amount of um, profit for society with the actions of their labor. Right, so it's not any one energy source that you could say is, is the source of value. It's not the coal per se, it's not the petroleum, it's not the natural gas, it's not even the fusion. It's the progression, it's the upward progression, it's the transformation from one to another is where the value lies, the progress lies. Exactly, yeah. And we've been sitting on the verge of this fusion revolution. Like, as of now, the future of mankind is fusion power, is thermonuclear fusion power and a thermonuclear fusion economy. And 
the most advanced expression of that that we have accessible to us is this helium-3 fusion. Right. So one day, fusion will be a thing of the past. Yeah, we got to get there first. Right. But you know, we have certain, you know, matter, antimatter is a prospect. Yeah. You know, so that it's not, again, value is not any object per se. It's the process of the creative advance of society. Right. But right now, if we're going to, so with that as kind of a, 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 a scientific basis, we can clearly define that right now the world needs fusion power and it needs helium-3 fusion power. You know, and this is something that's, you know, worth just describing and illustrating for people because helium-3 is one type of fuel for fusion. You have other types of fuel available. But helium-3 provides you with um, certain benefits, namely in that the, uh, all the products of the reaction are charged particles. So when you fuse either a helium-3 and a deuterium atom, or potentially two helium-3 atoms, what you get uh, as results of that fusion and release of energy, everything that's left over can be controlled by a magnetic field. Most other fusion fuels that are now being played with don't have that characteristic. So while they're still very beneficial, they release a lot of the energy in um, uncharged particles namely neutrons, which cannot be controlled by a magnetic field. Right. So what's the big deal? Well, with fusion, you're dealing with incredibly high temperatures, um, higher than the sun, potentially. So you need that magnetic field to control and confine that plasma, that fusion reaction plasma. And what you're getting into with that domain, and especially if everything, all the reactions occurring in there are charged particles and are subject to control of that um, magnetic field, the magnetic confinement system, is you're really entering a whole domain of uh, controlled high temperature plasmas at extremely high energy flux densities. And this has the ability to completely revolutionize um, materials processing. Mm -hmm. This has the ability to completely revolutionize um, uh, natural resources. You know, again, natural resources are not self-defined. They're defined by the state of your society. So if you, you know, there's been studies, if you take just an average cubic mile of dirt anywhere in the United States, it has many times the annual U.S. production, just in one cubic mile, many times the annual entire U.S. production of, of, uh, of iron or of aluminum or various other metals or different materials that are used. But under the current economy, there's no way we could access it because it's very dispersed. Right. But if we go to a high enough energy flux density, you can process larger uh, bulk material of lower, what would otherwise be lower quality ores, and you can do it at a greater efficiency. And so whole areas that we now think of as resources that are limited, that we're running out, there's finite supplies, that completely be becomes transformed under a fusion economy. So you completely transform your, your relationship to natural resources and eliminate many of these so-called limitations and uh, concerns that you know, are uh, supposedly an issue today. Well, that's what people have to be come to understand is that is, is in all of the, the crimes being committed with the current financial system, Wall Street and the city of London, and they're bad. People should go to jail for this. But the reason why people should really be upset with this current financial system and really want to reorganize it is because it's scientifically inept. It, it doesn't actually cohere with what we are as a species, mm -hmm. what the universe expects out of us. These are the terms in which I, the, the, the people on the planet who recognize what's happening right now, the fundamental shifts that are, that are, are occurring right now, the opportunity that's sitting in front of us, these are the issues which we must consider when we're talking about reorganizing the global financial system. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's what, I mean, we'll be providing more on this site in the coming days and weeks ahead. There'll be more from Mr. LaRouche, there'll be more from the basement team. But on this, uh, on the potential, so people have a, um, a clear map, so to speak, um, into the future. Um, what, what, what do you think the Chinese are pr 
What do you think the Chinese are thinking of doing in the next 10, 25, 50 years with this fusion capability? Um, how can the United States become a part of that? What's the reality of the United States becoming a part of that? And where ultimately can something like a helium-3 economy, uh, what powers do human beings, the Chinese and Americans hopefully working together and other nations, what power do we have at our disposal that will really um, put to shame the kinds of uh, power sources that we think exist on the planet today? I think the first step is the political shift. To get Obama out and Mr. LaRousse has clearly identified four absolutely necessary laws of action. Um, the Glass-Steagall law, the um, creation of a national banking system, the issuance of credit for productive, high technology, high energy flux density employment, increasing the productive powers of labor, and then commit immediately to a fusion driver, a crash program for fusion power. Now, there are various estimates on fusion power. We could be there in as little as 10 to 15 years, according to some of the top experts in the fusion community internationally. If we made the, uh, if we um, get our nation in line, get a government in there that's actually going to be committed to this, this level of development and progress. And if we uh, provided the resources needed under this 4.4 law program for a fusion driver, you know, it could be something like 10 years, give or take, to begin to realize the beginnings of these fusion power systems. And China has stated very clearly they're looking for collaboration and development. The issue is development. And the issue is development of the earth, producing all the requirements and needs for the world economy, the world population today. And the issue is doing that from the standpoint of mankind beginning, beginning to reach out into the solar system. You know, we're looking at the prospect where to fulfill the requirements on earth, we need to begin to reaching out into space. And the helium-3 is the beginning clearest example of that, that we have at our fingertips out there in the moon an abundance of the best fusion fuel available for mankind, which can, one, revolutionize the entire economy of the United States and of the world under that program. Two, it's the basis for the development of the whole inner solar system. It's also the best fuel for spaceships. Uh, getting around in space with anything less than fusion propulsion is a joke. You can do a few things, you can do some interesting things, but it's nothing more than kind of poking around and tossing a few things out there and bringing a few things back. Some of that's been impressive, it's been really important, but if we're going to actually sit down and say, let's be serious about defending our planet from asteroids and other threats in the solar system, let's be serious about developing the solar system under mankind's guidance and improving the conditions of the solar system, you need fusion propulsion. You need fusion powered transportation to get around the solar system and to have any type of uh, serious capability to develop uh, this whole territory. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for these reasons, when Mr. LaRouche said um, China's lunar program, guided by the conception and goal of helium-3 fuel for fusion power is the only sane, is the, is, the, is the metric that any sane national economy right now would be geared towards. It defines the uh, uh, definition of value, the definition of sanity for a national economy. A true science driver program that when completed is going to completely revolutionize mankind's capabilities on Earth and in the solar system. So the challenge for us now is to, you know, some people have referred to the landing in December of last year, China's landing on the moon. I mean, this one headline we found, uh, is China's jade rabbit a precursor to a helium-3 empire? You know, some people have raised, like, is this a new Sputnik moment? Mm -hmm. Is this going to be enough to rattle the sleeping American people to wake the hell up and realize if we're actually going to realize our capabilities as a nation, realize our constitutional obligation, realize the legacy of our republic as a 
beacon of hope for the world, that this is the direction we need to go in. And this current government is just beyond insane. It's genocidal and needs to go. And what Mr. LaRouche has defined for us is a very clear scientific conception of what we can replace that with. So I think the challenge now is on us, but also on the American people to make that happen. Well, this month happens to be the month where the Congress has left Washington, D.C. and gone back to their districts to campaign and to hear from the American people. And to our viewers and the rest of the American population, we have to deliver this message to the U.S. Congress. For these reasons, the United States has to change because the rest of the world is changing. Um, and we don't merely have to catch up, we have to lead because as Ben has said, we have, that is our legacy. And we still have a capacity here in the United States that many nations do not. Um, and for those reasons, Obama must be impeached. For those reasons, uh, we can redefine what our, our future map looks like 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years in the future. So this is your responsibility. This is the message you have to bring to your members of Congress to make them better. Um, thanks a lot, Ben. Thank you. And um, we'll see you next week. Stay tuned to LaRouche Pack for more updates.